Hi, good evening, church. I just turn to the person next to you and just tell them it's Pentecost today. All right, so for those of you that did not know, it is Pentecost today. I don't know about you guys, but um, when I grew up in church, I made this mistake this morning again. I'm still growing up in church. But when I grew up, I always had an understanding of the Pentecost as just the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in, the, in, in Acts 1 and Acts 2. All right, that was my understanding. Uh, I've been given the opportunity to have to preach and teach on this theme. And while I was just researching, I came to notice that it's not just about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's so much more to Pentecost than what we know. Right? So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to quickly lay down a foundation so that you understand what Pentecost looked like in the Old Testament. Yes, you heard it in the Old Testament. Right? There was a day called Pentecost in the Old Testament. And we're going to dig into that so we understand what it looked like, how it looked like in the New Testament, and how it is applicable to us today. Amen? Just turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready for this? All right, so what are we going to do first is we're going to look at the the Greek and the Hebrew meanings of the words, as usual. All right, so the Greek word for Pentecost is Pentecost. Fantastic. Good. Good. Awesome revelation. And what does it mean? Fifty. Great, let's end the service, let's go home. Isn't that just great? All right, the Hebrew word for Pentecost, which happened in the Old Testament, is the following. It was known as the day of marriage between God and the Jews. This Hebrew word is called Shavuot, and it was known and considered as the day of marriage between God and his nation Israel. Not only that, it was the marriage between heaven and earth. This is how the Hebrews knew it. When you say the word Pentecost, all right, that's a Greek word, for them they would hear Shavuot, immediately what would come to remembrance is the day of marriage between God and Israel, his nation. Amen? Not only that, but the marriage of heaven and earth. Jesus says, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right? So today is not just uh, another day. Today is a memorial or let's say, uh, what was the Afrikaans word word I used this morning? Herdenken. Is that a memorial? Right? Today is a memorial of this marriage day. Okay? So it's just not not just another Sunday. It's a memorial. Right? So what, what else was it known as? It was known as the anniversary of the Sinai revelation. So what was the Sinai revelation Um, According to these Hebrews, it was the day that God gave the Torah to the Israelites. Now, Torah meaning the first five books of the Bible, but here we're seeing a specific passage, the the Ten Commandments given, all right, in this specific passage that we're talking about, the Ten Commandments, the law. But Shavuot and Pentecost was the climax of anticipation of this marriage day. Right, this marriage day of God to, the, to Israel at Mount Sinai. It was also known as the counting of 50 days. Shavuot, Pentecost, the bride was waiting in expectation for the bridegroom to come. This was the Hebrew culture. This is how they knew it. This is how they approached this day of Pentecost. It was a day of anticipation. It was a day of excitement. Right? 50 days of counting. Right? What does that mean? 50 days from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There was this counting process. For those of you that weren't here with the Ascension Day service, um, you once spoke a lot about the, the, the bridegroom, getting uh, the bride and the bridegroom, the marriage, and um, how this whole process took place. In these 50 days, there was an anticipation. The bride had to be ready. The bride had to, she never knew. Nobody knows the day. Nobody knows the hour. She never knew the day. She never knew the hour that the bridegroom would come and fetch her. She just had to be ready. Right? She just had to be ready. So let's have a look at this first Pentecost that we find in the Old Testament. And open your Bibles with me to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. So as we said, the Shavuot was known as the day of marriage between God and the Jews. The marriage between heaven and earth. Shavuot occurred 50 days after the exodus from Egypt. Right, 50 days from the, after the exodus of Egypt, I want you to keep that in mind. And just before that exodus was a, uh, another feast called the Passover. Keep those two in mind. All right, say it with me, Passover. 
Exodus, Pentecost. Okay. So in Exodus 19, what we see from verse 4 to 5, let's read it together. Right. You yourselves have seen what I did to, the, to Egypt. This is God speaking. And how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of the nations of the whole earth, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. From verse 7 to 8, let's just read verse 8. The people all responded together. We will do everything that the Lord has said. And in verse 10, okay, we'll come to verse 10 just now. In this, in verse 4 and verse 5, if you remember two weeks ago, we spoke about um, the covenants, covenants that God made. We see that God is talking covenant language to the people of Israel, right? I've brought you to myself, I've brought you to myself, right? And here he says, if you will keep my covenant, what is that? What is he speaking about? This marriage process, if you will keep this covenant, you will be unto me a special treasure, a holy people, a holy nation. God enters a covenant with uh, the re- a covenant relationship with the Israelites. In verse 4 to 6, the Shavuot or Pentecost signifies a selection of Israel as God's chosen people. You will be to me a chosen people out of all the nations. Right? If you understand covenant relationship, just turn to the person next to you and say, understand it. Covenant language. If you understand covenant language, you will understand that. Right? Let me just read the scripture again here. You yourselves have been said, seen what I've done. Um, now, if you fully obey me, you will keep my covenant. Then you will be out of all of the nations. You will be my special treasure, my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now, in the New Testament, Peter says in, in 1 Peter, one of the chapters over there, it says that once you were not a people, but now you've become a people. That is covenant language. That is covenant language, right? I'm taking you, setting you apart from all the other nations of the earth, and I'm making you my possession. You belong to me, right? Marriage, right? We become one. You belong to me. From verse um, 10 to 11, let's just read it together. And the Lord said to Moses, go tell the people to consecrate themselves. Consecrate them today and tomorrow. And have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because uh, on that day the Lord will come down to Mount Sinai and in the sight of all the people. Right? The people were called to be set apart and consecrated, washed and ready. This is how the bride had to prepare herself. The bride had to be washed and ready. Like we said just now with uh, the whole um, Ascension's Day message. The bride had to be washed and ready because the bridegroom could come any day, any time. Then you just need to pack your, I was going to say, you just need to pack your bags and roll, baby. All right? I was going to say, but I didn't. (laughs) Right, in Exodus 20. All right, in Exodus 20, God seals this covenant by giving the law. If you remember what we spoke about the covenants, right, God seals his covenants, and the Mosaic covenant was sealed with the law. All right. God institutes the Shavuot as a feast, as a memorial of the marriage, um, marriage covenant to God. Right, so this specific um, event that happened in the Old Testament was instituted as a feast. You will remember this. You will celebrate this. You will celebrate it. It will be for you a memorial. And we see though that, that in Exodus 23 and Exodus 34. All right, so this was in short the first Pentecost. The first Pentecost, which we call the Shavuot. All right, just say Pentecost. Say Shavuot. Old Testament, New Testament. All right. Great, thanks for that. All right. So when was it celebrated? As we said, it was 50 days after the Exodus. Keep that in mind. It's important. We're going to get back to that. Shavuot Pentecost occurred in the third month of the Hebrew calendar. The third month of the Hebrew calendar was called Sivan. This was not a Hebrew word, all right? But the Hebrew word, I'm going to come to the Hebrew word of that one now. I'm just jumping my notes here. According to the rabbinic, uh, rabbinic teachings, in the month of Sivan, everybody saw the revelation at Mount Sinai. So in this month of Pentecost, this, everybody knows that this happened. 
right? They saw the revelation on Mount Sinai. They, there was a giving of the Torah, the Old Testament, like we said in this, this passage, the, the Ten Commandments. The blowing of the shofar and fire. And they also witnessed God's covenant agreement that he made with Israel, with the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. The covenant agreement. Right? So when the Hebrews would hear the word Shavuot, or the Greek word Pentecost, they would immediately remember what? Covenant agreement. Right? The marriage of God and Israel. The marriage of heaven and earth. Okay. According to the rabbinic teachings, rabbinic, I'm going to say rabbinic because that's just, just how it comes out. All right? The Hebrew interpretation of the word sivan means the following. Right? So the Hebrew interpretation for this word means the following. It's the month of vision right? and the power to walk. It means to move and to accelerate in our service of God. These aren't necessarily people that are filled with the Holy Spirit. But this is what it was known to their culture. That the, the month of Sivan was known as the month of vision. The month of the power to walk. The month um, to move and to accelerate in the service of God. Amen. Just turn to the person next to you. Say month of vision. Power to walk. Move and accelerate in our service of God. So just have, let's have a look at these three points. Um, the month of vision. In the Old Testament, the revelation and the majesty of God. This is what they, they, um, what they saw. And the, they got the receiving of the Torah in fear and trembling. In the New Testament, there's a revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. A revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. going to look at the detail of that just now all my wonderful notes here the next point power to walk and power to move in the old testament we see that there was wanderings through the desert they moved through the desert they walked through the desert it wasn't pleasant it wasn't easy it was a burden they longed for slavery back in egypt again so this wandering through the desert was worse than being slaves in egypt just imagine how bad it was then all right but in the New Testament, in Acts 1 verse 8, open your Bibles at Acts 1. Remember we said, month of vision, power to walk, move and accelerate in our service of God. Okay, just say that with me again. Month of vision, power to walk. Move and accelerate in our service of God. Okay. Acts 1 verse 8 said the following. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Power to walk. Right? Power to walk. Power to be my witnesses. Right? We see the laying down of dead works and the empowerment to walk in the good works. This is what we see in the church of Acts. The ability to lay down these dead works, these things that don't benefit me. And to pick up, to walk in the good works that God prepared for us. Amen? Ephesians 2 verse 10 says that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do the good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. Good works which he prepared in advance for you to do. But God gives you the Holy Spirit to walk in them. To give you the empowerment, to give you the strength to be able to walk in these good works. Amen? Right. That which was once lame and disabled can now be enabled through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That which was once lame and disabled, remember we said power to walk. That which was once lame and disabled can now be enabled. Right, say it with me. That which was once lame and disabled can now be enabled. Right, we're going to shorten it. Say so lame, disabled, enabled. And where do we see this? We see this in Hebrews 12. Right, we see this in Hebrews 12. I think it's from verse 11 where it says, uh, trade up. What does it say there? Strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. 
But that which was once lame, I can't remember the scripture. Just go read it yourselves, okay? Believe me. All right. And let's open your Bibles at Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. We're just going to touch on a few scriptures here. So we said that power to, where is it? Month of vision, power to walk, move and accelerate in the service of God. Lame, disabled, now become enabled. Ezekiel 37. And we're reading from verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. Right? The Spirit of the Lord will bring us out into the plans and the purposes of God. The Spirit of the Lord will bring us out to where God wants us to be. Right? Where God wants you to be. If you have a life submitted to the Spirit, you will be where He wants you to be. Jesus Christ says that where I am, there my servant will be. How will you be where Jesus Christ wants you to be? Through the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. He will be the one that guides you. He will be the one that teaches you. He will be the one that leads you to where Jesus Christ is. Amen. So the Spirit brought me out. Right? He brought me out. I was brought out by the Spirit. And He set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. Fantastic. Full of things that were lame. Full of things that were disabled. Right, verse 4. Then He said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath, in some translations, other translations it says, I will pour out my spirit, All right, I will cause my spirit to enter you and you will come to life. Amen. I will cause my spirit to enter you and you will come to life. In verse 10 it says the following, so I prophesied and as he commanded me, the breath entered them. Like I said in other translations, it says, my spirit entered them and they came to life and stood up on their feet as a vast army so god gives us the spirit to empower us god gives us a spirit to 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 walk with power but not only that those areas in your life that are dead those areas in your life that are weak those struggles that you have god has given you the ability to overcome through who through the holy spirit that is at work within you if you have jesus christ but if you have His Spirit living within you, you have the empowering, empowerment, I don't know what the right word is, but there it is, empowerment to overcome. Amen? He will bring life by speaking forth, by sending forth His Spirit. He will bring life to those dead areas, those areas that are not bringing fruit in your life. Amen? So when I am weak, he is strong. It's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. Right? The third point, they accelerate in our service of God. There was a quickening anointing to fulfill the works of God. It is the spirit that quickens. In John 6 verse 63, it says that the spirit quickens. Now that specific word quickens um, in the New, King's James, New King James, all right, it means to bring life. Right? But not only life, it means to accelerate the work. So it is the spirit that not only brings life in you, but it accelerates the work. It brings the work of God into fulfillment quicker in your life. Right? That which is supposed to take 20 years can now happen in two years. That's through the working of the Holy Spirit within you. Amen? So quickening anointing to fulfill the works of God. It is a spirit that quickens, that brings life, brings acceleration. Acts 1 and 2, we're going to have a look at an example now. So just page in your Bibles back to Acts chapter 1. We're going to see an example of this quickening work here. Are you still with me? I just say this with me. Month of vision. Power to walk. Move and accelerate in our service of God. What was lame and disabled can now be enabled. Okay, you didn't say it with the stutter. Okay. Enabled. All right. 
So we read in verse 1, it says that you will, be, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of all of the earth. Now, how on earth do you think, how, many, how long do you think it's going to take these disciples to be witnesses to the ends of the earth? thousand years, hundred years, all right? Now it says first, no, let's, let's leave that. Um, let's look at chapter 2. Let's look at chapter 2. Jesus Christ tells his disciples to go and wait in Jerusalem, all right? So in chapter 2, we're going to read from verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, all right? Say from every nation under heaven. So when the Bible says something, it means it. From every nation under heaven. What were they doing there? Right? It says that they were staying there. But this time of Pentecost, if you look at the first verse in chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost came. When the day of Pentecost came, there were all of these Jews from every nation under heaven there. Pentecost, or let's call it the Shavuot, the Old Testament version or the Hebrew version of it, was one of the three pilgrimage um, festivals. What did that mean? That the whole nation of Israel had to come. They had to come to the holy city of Jerusalem. You had to be there. So just imagine Durban's beachfront in December. Packed. All the Gauteng is everyone on the face of this earth goes down to Durban. That's how it feels. And then the Durbanites go and hide away. All right? So every nation, Jews, it says, devout Jews from every nation under heaven. So these Jews came from all over. These Jews were also born in other nations. So they grew up in different languages. They, they could speak different languages. All right? Now what happens? The Holy Spirit is poured out. And these God-fearing Jews from all the nations of the earth that have grown up in different nations hear the word of God in those specific languages. And it names like 10 or 20 or 50 different languages. They hear the word of God in those languages. And what happens? These Jews go back to their nation. They don't only hear the word of God. They have this experience of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So what happens? That prophetic word that was given, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Whoa, all of a sudden there's a quickening work. There's a quickening work. It's not going to be a thousand years. It's somewhere going to be one month, right? Tomorrow it's going to happen that the Holy Spirit will be poured out and you will testify to nations and all the nations under heaven. One place, one time, where I am, there my servant must be. Amen. Where I am, there my servant will be. These, these God-fearing Jews go back to the nations, not only with the word of God, not only with the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but a revelation or experience of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen? God has divine appointments planned for you and I, right? He wants to quicken the work of his kingdom. And we also see another example um, with, when Philip and goes and meets the Ethiopian man. He was taken up in the spirit. Taken up in the spirit right there. Right? I want to use the word teleported. but I didn't use it. I just wanted to use it. But it was there. All of a sudden. right? Gave that Ethiopian man the word of God. And the gospel of Jesus Christ was spread. So we see this whole from chapter 1 up till chapter 8. We see how God is busy working with, his, with the Jewish nation. And from there onwards, we see how the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out to the ends of the earth, specifically to Gentiles, specifically spoken to Gentiles. Right? So we saw that accelerate in the service of God. So how was this, this feast celebrated? Like I said, it was one of three pilgrimage festivals where the entire nation ascends to the holy temple. Right? Why did they ascend to the holy temple? To be seen by God. That was one of the reasons that they came. That we are supposed to present ourselves, wait and be seen by God. In the Old Testament, they had to wash themselves, cleanse themselves, and wait for who? For God. 
They had to wait. They had to present themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai for who? For God, right? To be seen by God and also renew their commitment to the law of Moses, right? Renew their commitment to the law of Moses. The Bible says that this law is a law of sin and death. It brings death, okay? Turn to the person next to you, say law of sin and death. But the awesome thing about Pentecost is how God comes and hijacks this situation. He hijacks this festival and he pours out his spirit because it's a spirit that brings life. The letter brings death, but the spirit brings life. It's a new day for the church. God is doing a new move. So when we speak of uh, church unusual, he's doing a new move. He's arresting He's arresting the work of tradition. He's arresting the work of religion and bringing about a move of his spirit. Amen. The entire nation of Israel would come and they would renew their commitment to the law of Moses. Right? They considered the temple a porthole between heaven and earth. Right? This wasn't just some fantasy. This is what they considered. This is the truth. This is the portal of heaven to earth. Right? That's how they experienced it. That's how they approached it. Right? They would go there for a direct experience with God. That was the culture. We will go to Jerusalem because there we are going to have a direct experience with God. Okay? This portal from heaven to earth. And we see an example in Genesis 28 verse 17 where Jacob has this dream and he sees this ladder, ladder um, descending from heaven. And touching earth, right? Descending from heaven and touching earth. And he says, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This, and then he went and called the place Bethel, the house of God. Is this not the house of God? In the Hebrew culture, they would approach this place with fear and trembling. In the Hebrew culture, they would approach this place as the portal Right? As the portal for he- where heaven invades earth. In this place, they would come for a God experience. They would recommit themselves to the law of Moses. How many times did they hear the law of Moses? Uh, I know the, the Israeli kids had to learn the Torah, the first five books of the, the Bible. All right. Until they were age 13 or something like that. They had to know it off by heart. How many times did they hear the same thing over and over and over and over again? But this was a festival that they approached like we are coming to this as if we hear the word of God for the very first time. That is how they would approach it. That was the custom. As if we're hearing the word of God for the very first time. It's so easy in church When we speak the same thing every Sunday, when you hear the same principles every Sunday, to become so familiar and, ugh, maybe the grass is greener on that side. Then you go there, you hear the message, and then they start repeating the same message, the same thing. They can get so familiar. These guys were hammered with the word of God. Those, they didn't they know that off by heart. And then they go and punish themselves every year again to go and commemorate this thing i considered the temple a portal for between heaven and earth right they would go there for a direct experience with god they did not just observe the feast but they relived the sinai experience for them it was reliving this whole experience as if they were receiving the torah anew right the way they participated and behaved on this day was considered to have a direct influence and outcome on their entire year What if the way you worship tonight has a direct influence on the rest of your year? How different would your worship be tonight? That is how they approached this day of Pentecost. That the way I worship God today, the way I listen to His Word today, the way I receive His Word today is going to influence the rest of my year. How different would your worship be? Right. The next point is on the evening of the Shavuot, it was customary to devote themselves to the reading of the Torah, punishing themselves again. 
We just read it. We're just reading it again. We just studied it our whole lives. We know it off by heart. They can, they can quote it. You just ask them, give us this scripture. Those little kids of 13 years old could just quote it just like this. Now they're going again and reading it, reading it, reading it. All right? It was a celebration of God as the owner of all land. All right? All land as his private property. Right? They brought the first fruits um, in this whole celebration. They brought the first fruits of the grain offering as a, as a grain harvest. Psalm 24, we see the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. In Hebrews 2 verse 10 as well. So this was, just, this was a celebration not only of the marriage of God and Israel, but an acknowledgement that God is the owner of all things. Right? All things. Your wallet is not yours. Your bank account is not yours. Your future is not yours. God is the owner of all things. Okay? Think about that. Right, we're going to quickly look at the chronological order of the feast from Passover to Pentecost. There is method to this madness, so if you will just stick with me. Right, so we see the first, the first feast, Passover. Right, in the Old Testament... We see that a lamb was slaughtered and blood was smeared on the door. In the New Testament at Passover, we see that Jesus Christ was crucified and blood was shed on the cross, right? This was the covenant memorial, okay? So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this overlaps with the Feast of First Fruits. But in the Old Testament, we see that, that the Israelites had to pack up to leave. After the Passover, God says, now you pack up your things and you leave. And the, the Bible tells us that there was no time for them to make bread with yeast. There was no time to sit and wait for this thing to rise. They had to pack up, clean out their house, right? So there was no time for yeast. Yeast is symbolic of a sinful nature, right? Yeast is symbolic of a sinful nature. So what they had to do is make bread, unleavened bread, and they had to eat that, right, for the, the weeks to come. first fruit of barley harvest was presented as a wave offering in the new testament right we see jesus christ here in the grave we see the resurrected christ um, ascends to heaven jesus christ that died to deal with this yeast nature jesus christ that died to remove this yeast nature right so he ascends to heaven and he brings the blood before the um the mercy seat and the blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat as an offering once and for all for the sin of man amen once and for all for the sin of man. Why? So that yeast can be removed. All right. Just turn to the neighbor and just say, yeast out. Okay. And then we come, right, so here in the Old Testament, we see the exodus. And in the New Testament, we see the re resurrection. The exodus out of slavery. Resurrection life out of death. Amen. Exodus, say it with me. Exodus out of slavery. Resurrection from death. And we also see the Feast of Weeks, which is seven weeks. And the, the, how can I say, the pinnacle of this was the Feast of Pentecost, which was on the 50th day. Was the ending of this whole celebration, this Feast of Weeks. All right, so we're going to have a look at a few examples here. In the Old Testament, we see there was an assembly or a gathering at Mount Sinai. Say assembly, Mount Sinai. In the New Testament, we see an assembly and a gathering in Jerusalem. The gathering of the saints, the gathering of the disciples, the gathering of all the Jews under heaven and earth. All right? They would come up, one of the pilgrimage feasts. All right? But in Hebrews 12, verse 22 and 24, it says that you have not come to Mount Sinai, but you have come to Mount Zion, the city, Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of our God. Amen? You have come to Jerusalem the city of our God. Right, this is the parallels here. The next point, Exodus 19, verse 4 to 6. We see that there was a selection of, the, um, of Israel as a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people. Right? They received their identity as a people through this covenant relationship with God. If you can remember what we spoke two weeks ago about covenant relationship, that when my coat resembled who I am. So when I give you my coat, I'm busy saying this is not who you now are. You will be unto me a special treasure, right? Go to the points here. A special treasure is my godly opinion. 
kingdom of priests, a godly function, a holy nation, a godly position. In the New Testament, in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, we see the exact same scripture. Exact same scripture. The covenant being reaffirmed. The identity given to the church. Right? Reaffirmed. And then we see also the church being called as the ecclesia. Right? The called out ones. The ones that are set apart. The assembly of God. Just a point under there. Um, what, they, what they talk about, this whole process of Shavuot, was that a nation was born in one day. That's how the, the Hebrews know it. That at Shavuot, a nation was born in one day. At Pentecost, the church was born in one day. Amen? Right? So we're seeing the parallels between first Pentecost, if we can call it like that, and the New, and the New Testament Pentecost. In Exodus 19, they were told to wash their clothes and to be ready. When God speaks in the New Testament, Jesus Christ says to the disciples, go to Jerusalem, right? Old Testament, go to Mount Sinai, go to the foot of Mount Sinai and wait. New Testament, go to Jerusalem, the heavenly city and wait. Right? Here at, at Mount Sinai in the Old Testament, the law was given to the Israelites. In the New Testament, the gospel was given to the Jews. Right? The gospel was given to the Jews, a demonstration of the Spirit's power, not wise and um, persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Right? On the Old Testament, it was written uh, on tablets of stone by the finger of God. Right? Just say, finger of God. Are we coming back to the finger of God? Because you need to remember that. Right? So it is written on tablets of stone by the finger of God. In the New Testament, it is written on our hearts and our minds by the working of the Holy Spirit. So who writes it in our hearts and our minds? The Holy Spirit. The Old Testament, it was written on tablets of stone. Right? I think it's Ezekiel 36. It says, I will remove from you a heart of stone and I will put my spirit in you and I will give you a heart of flesh. Why? So that I can put my words in there. It's no longer the law written on tablets of stone, but he takes that. He gives you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit empowers you bringing it within you, working it within you. Amen. In the Old Testament, in Exodus 32, after all of these things, we see that Moses comes down and before they'd even received the law, they were breaking the law. Okay? Sounds like children at a school. Before they'd even received the law, they were busy breaking the law. Now just imagine if you left a classroom of kids for 40 days and 40 nights together, what they would be doing. Now, the, the nation of Israel was doing exactly the same. Before they received the rest of the law, they were busy breaking it. Okay? So what, is, what does Moses do? He sends the Levites out, and 3,000 men are killed on that day because of the law. In the New Testament, we see that 3,000 men are saved. By who? In the Old Testament, the Levites, the men that worked in the temple. In the New Testament, the apostles, the people that worked in the house of God. Amen. So this is the working of the Holy Spirit, that there where there was death, there is now life. Okay? He not only works in the, in the, the natural, he not only works with natural things like tablets of stone and heart and mind, he works with the spiritual environment. That, was, that which happened in the Old Testament in the spirit environment, he comes and he brings restoration. Right? He brings a new day. The law of sin and death, we, we said just now the law of the spirit of life sets us free from the law of sin and death. But this law of sin and death right, speaks of God's finger. Right? God's finger of judgment. Where do we see this? God's finger of judgment. Exodus 8 verse 19, where um, these magicians in, in Pharaoh's courts were just saying, Look, this is the finger of God that is against us. This is the finger of God that is doing all of these things. But Pharaoh's heart was still hardened. Right? We also see that God writes his law, as we said in Exodus 31. He writes it with his finger. And then also in Daniel, the, the judgments, the judgment on the people were written by God's finger. So in the Old Testament, we see that the judgment of God was written by his finger. In the New Testament, his mercy and his grace is poured out through the working of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Right, say with me, judgment turned into grace. 
Right? In the Old Testament, it was accompanied by fire, by thunder, and the sounding of a trumpet. In the New Testament, it was accompanied by rushing wind, tongues of fire, um, tongues of man, devotional tongues. I want to stop quickly at this tongues of fire. We all know that fire descended on the people. Is that correct? And it says that the, the fire split into tongues upon the people. Now, according to the Hebrew commentaries, these tongues were called cloven tongues. Do you know what cloven meant to the, 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 the Hebrew culture? Animals with cloven hooves were considered pure and holy for sacrifice. Pure and holy to bring before God. So when it was a cloven tongue, God was busy telling them, this work that I'm busy doing is pure. This work that I'm doing is clean. It is palatable. Right? It's kosher. You can put it that way. You, cannot, you can put it in your mouth. It's not only supposed to be on your head. You can take it and put it in your mouth and start speaking forth this work of God. Right? Not only on your mouth, but also when you swallow it, it is within it is within. At the Passover, what they would have to do is sacrifice the lamb. They would bry the lamb, if we can call it that way, at a spit bry. And then they would have to eat the whole lamb. The lamb of Jesus, the lamb Jesus Christ crucified at the cross is now the lamb that is within me, that brings me life, that sustains me. You carry Jesus Christ within. The same way the Holy Spirit, we're not operating just under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is within us. Amen. The Holy Spirit is within you. The Word of God says that you have received the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the world does not accept it because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him for He is with you and He will live in you. This work of God is clean. This work of God is pure. This work of God is acceptable for you to put in your mouth and to start speaking forth the utterances of God. Amen. The law was sealed, the law of Moses was sealed by the, oh, sorry, the covenant of Moses was sealed by the law. The new covenant was sealed by the Holy Spirit. Right? If you understand the covenant language, you'll understand the, the whole meaning of the seal. In Exodus 24 verse 8, blood was sprinkled on all flesh. So Moses came down, they gave the laws, etc. They finished all of these things and then they took blood with a hyssop thing. And they started sprinkling blood on the whole nation. That is the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon, upon all flesh. Acts 2 verse, 20, verse 16 to 21. It says, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. This was a work that was very unusual for the Hebrew culture. Because it was for, usually for men. It wasn't for the women. It was usually for adults, not for the children. Okay? And here God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all men. On all women. On children, right? Your, young, your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. I'll pour out my spirit, man and woman, and they will serve me. They will prophesy. This is the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It sets us free from religion. And it brings about a new day. It brings about a new working of God in our lives. Amen? This feast was marked by the bringing of the first fruits, the grain offering, and a distinguishing feature of this offering was the two leavened loaves. Now, just for us to understand this, is that the two leavened loaves became a wave offering before the altar of God. All right, a wave offering before the altar of God. Now, nowhere in the Hebrew culture or in the, the, the priesthood of that time, the priestly era, would they use yeast in the temple of God. Because yeast symbol, was symbolic of that sinful nature so they would use unleavened bread so how is it now all of a sudden we're bringing leavened bread into the presence of god because this work is not only for the jews it's also for the gentiles this work is not only for the jews it is also for the gentiles the gentiles will be brought into the presence of god to worship a wave offering to worship amen interesting thing about this day was that um, let me, let me, I'll come back to that now the disciples at Pente Pentecost and the converts were considered the first fruits of the New Testament church 
So in the Old Testament, you would bring the first fruits of your grain harvest. In the New Testament, the salvations, the redemptions, the, the disciples and the um, converts, new converts were considered this first fruits. Right? It's interesting that in this time period, Jesus speaks to his disciples and he says, the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. Right? The harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. What happens? The Holy Spirit is poured out and the word of God, the gospel of God goes to all the nations of the earth. Now, this is what I want to get to is that on this specific day, the scroll of Ruth was read. Why? Because the whole story, if you go read it, the whole story of Ruth happened in this month of, who can remember the month's name? Sivan. Right? This whole story of Ruth happened in this month of Sivan. Okay? And who was Ruth? She wasn't a Hebrew. She wasn't a Hebrew. But what happened? She was brought into the family of God. She became one. And from this marriage, not from this marriage, but from this genealogy, we see King David coming forth and we see Jesus Christ coming forth. Right? This Gentile was brought into the house of God, into the family of God, which brought forth the King of Kings, if I can put it that way. Right? Just in closing... I want to just briefly look at um, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the church, the dynamics between these three. In Luke 1 verse 35, Jesus Christ was born of the Spirit, all right? So then the angel said to her, speaking to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, right? And so the holy, pure, sinless thing, offspring, will, uh, which shall be born of you will be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Amen. And he will bring forth a work of God within your life that is pure, that is spotless. The incorruptible seed of God will be a birth forth, or how can I say it, will, will grow, will blossom within you. Amen. But we also see in the New Testament that the church was born from this pouring, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ in Luke 3 verse 23, we see that Jesus Christ was baptized in water, but then the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove, right? We see the Holy Spirit in the New Testament being poured out, poured out over the church, coming in flames, tongues of flames. Jesus Christ coming on him like a, the, like a dove in the New Testament. Jesus Christ, uh, the church, tongues of fire, right? The third point the, uh, Jesus Christ was led by the Holy Spirit. Luke 4 verse 1 says that Jesus, full, and, full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit, returned to the Jordan and was led now by the Holy Spirit into the desert. Full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit within. You need to live a life submitted to the Holy Spirit. That's what it speaks about, the, the control of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 says that the mind controlled by the Spirit is life is life, is spirit and life. That, what it, that is what it means to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, is a life submitted. But not just, I'm not just operating under the anointing, under the Holy Spirit, I have the Holy Spirit within me. Jesus Christ, full of the Holy Spirit, returned and was led, right? He doesn't just lead, lead us to green pastures, He leads us to where we need to be. He led Jesus Christ in the desert, okay? He led Jesus Christ to the desert, Luke 4 verse 14, we, uh, Jesus Christ was empowered by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ came out of the desert, it said that he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the news spread from him from town to town. The news spread because there was power, a manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. What do we see in the New Testament? The New Testament church, the power of, of God, the word of God is spread. The people start knowing them as these Christians the working of the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Amen? Luke 4, verse 18 to 19. Jesus Christ was anointed to fulfill the year of Jubilee. I'm just going to read the scripture so you're just with me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me, the anointed one, the Messiah, to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce, to release the captives and, recov and recovery of sight for the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, those who are, are 
downtrodden, who are bruised, who are crushed, who are broken down by calamity, to proclaim the, an, the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the free favors of God profusely abound. When was this year? This was the year of Jubilee. This was the year of Jubilee. We said Pentecost mean 50. The year of Jubilee occurred every 50 years. Right? Pentecost mean 50. The year of Jubilee occurred every 50 years. And in this time when Jesus Christ died, was resurrected, ascended, and the Holy Spirit was poured out, was in the 80th Jubilee. Now, if you know what that means, eight, the number 8 or 80 means a new day. Jesus Christ, being the 80th Jubilee, fulfilled this and brought a new day for the church, brought a new day for the believers. Amen? Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the feasts. So we don't have to go and reenact all of these things. We can just, what, what do you call it, commemorate? Bring it to remembrance? Have it as a memorial? Right? So we don't have to go reenact all of these things. He is the Sabbath of all Sabbaths. Right? We need to walk in the principles of the life of Jesus Christ to find rest. He is the Jubilee of Jubilees. Right? He is the Jubilee of all Jubilees. So when he says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, we were looking at examples of everything of Jesus Christ and the parallel between him and the church. When he says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, where is the Spirit of the Lord now? Upon us as the church. Upon us as the church. And we have the same, we have the same commission. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us as the church, the firstborn of Jesus Christ. He has anointed us. Just say this with me. He has anointed us. You can just throw all of that stuff out there, Arthur. He has anointed us to preach the good. Just read it with me. One, two, three. He has anointed us to preach the good news to the poor. He has anointed us to announce freedom to the captives. He has anointed us to, for recovery sight to the blind. He has anointed us to deliver those who are oppressed. He has anointed us to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee. Amen. That is the great commission that God gives us as well. Right? It's not only go and make disciples, but it's go set free, go preach the good news, go announce freedom, go bring recovery of sight. Deliver those who are oppressed. Proclaim the acceptable year of God. Amen? Amen. Can the band just come to the front? And I want us just to stand and I want us to, um, can we just have that last, that last screen with all of those points there? I want us to stand and I want us to pray this over ourselves. Right, let's ask God that this will become a reality. This will become truth within us as a church. Right? Can we just pray together? Just pray it on your own time. Father, we just thank you that you have sent your spirit upon us. Thank you that you have anointed us, Lord. You have anointed us. You have anointed us to preach the good news to the poor. Let's just lift our voice and pray. Lift, lift, lift your voice and pray. God, may this be evident in our church. May this be evident in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. That your good news will be overflowing within us. Lord, we thank you that us as your church, that we will announce freedom to the captives. In the name of Jesus Christ, this will be our lifestyles. This will be our lifestyles, a lifestyle of evangelism, bringing the captives in, Lord. But not only that, Lord, those that are enslaved, those that are still in slavery, Father God, in different facets of their lives, that we can bring freedom through the working of your Spirit, Lord. Through the working of your Spirit, Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray that those, those whose eyes are blind, blind, blind to your work, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, that they will be opened in Jesus' name. Not only spiritually, but also physically, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for deliverance for those who are oppressed, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Not only physically, Lord, but spiritually oppressed, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. We just proclaim the acceptable year. The year of your favor, Lord. We proclaim, we declare it. The year of your favor of your church. The year of your favor of your people, Lord. The year when slaves are set free. The year when, you, when, when creation breathes. The year when creation is set free, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ. We declare that over this, over this church. We declare that over this city. We declare that in this nation. A year, a year of jubilee. A year that is acceptable in the sight of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Let's just lift our voice in prayer. Let's lift our voice in prayer. 
Breke seti atala na bara bahandi atala na bosondo robi tere meshi atala na bara bohondo yotoro bokokur. Holy Spirit, come in this place. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come and activate us. Holy Spirit, come and activate us. Come and activate us. Empower us. Fall afresh on us, Holy Spirit. Fall afresh on us in Jesus' name. Fall afresh on us in Jesus' name. We have a desire for your work. We have a desire for the outflow of your power. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, Holy Spirit, you've come to empower your church through the gifts. You've come to empower your church through the nature of God, Lord. We want more. We want more. We want more. We want more. We want to be positioned for more. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Come and change. Come and touch in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's just cry out. Let's just cry out. Let's take hold of him. Let's take hold of him. Cry out for him tonight. Cry out for that work of the Holy Spirit in your life.